Hey there, it's Audrey Waters again, trying in 10 minutes or less to respond to everyone in this thread. Um, there is this strange tension that I wonder if it's actually inescapable when it comes to trust, vulnerability, privacy, and computer technologies. The modern computer was developed, after all, as a weapon of war. Its history is intertwined with cryptography, with decoding the secrets of others. And the internet, too, is developed in part as a tool of military, of command, control, and communications. We laud the latter, rightly so. But just as the internet and the web have become powerful tools for communication, they have remained tools for command and control. We have built the infrastructure for a network that connects us to one another, and we have built an infrastructure that has become a network for surveillance. So state-run surveillance systems have a long history. Corey talked about the Stasi, for example, but surveillance really predates both the 20th and 21st century technologies. It predates fascism, it predates global capitalism, it predates Google. These practices have been honed, no doubt, generation after generation, decade, century after century. They've been made more efficient now thanks to computers thanks to networks, thanks to data analysis. Surveillance is more and more sophisticated. It's increasingly technological. It's hardwired and hard-coded into our day-to-day -day lives, into the most banal acts, right? Watching a movie online, reading an ebook, sending a text message, taking a quiz, doing homework. Surveillance is, of course, ideological. Here I think we see the state and corporations enforcing surveillance as normal, as normative, as the way we actually care about and watch over, watch out for one another. We watch because we care, right? So confusing with surveillance with care has huge implications for school, which still retain a mission that involve not just the intellectual development of students, but also the care for students as well. So Nishan mentioned this quote, the collective winking game around openness. And I think that there's actually a similar game around education technology. For those who've long been proponents of bringing computers into the classroom, we've often relied on these arguments that new technologies will be powerful and empowering, that they will open up for students new opportunities to learn, to connect, to experiment, to play, to build, to make but we actually haven't done a very good job talking about these other legacies that technology, that computers bring with them. We haven't done a good job helping students understand what this means for them. Instead, I think that, you know, I think we've, we've hoped that computers would bring about a more progressive education, more hands-on, project-based, self-directed, inquiry-based. Instead, they're used Computers are used to run students through the paces to make what is a traditional education sort of more efficient. Flashcards, digital textbooks, adaptive textbooks, adaptive testing. All of these demand that students hand over their personal data, that they give up their privacy, that they give up control of their learning to the companies, to schools, and to the state. So here's another tension, I think, between the tension between the vulnerability and the invulnerability of being online, right? Between the tension of, between teaching and learning with powerful tools, between the possibility of connecting with everyone and the reality of a global surveillance network. Because the thing is our own records, our own digital trail, our own data, now that they are intermediated with these devices, they're actually quite fragile, right? So we were long cautioned, some of us were, that this will go down on our permanent record. But now we exist in this strange world in which our school record is both more permanent and much less so, right? So we pour ourselves, our thoughts, our ideas, our learning into one application or another. We sort of we 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 put everything into them all of our most personal data 
And yet then these applications, they go offline, they go away, the company gets acquired, our data gets sold. Increasingly, we actually cannot look at our permanent record. We cannot access it, we cannot correct it. The data about what we've done in various digital learning environments is not ours. It's not ours to examine, let alone be able to dictate who else might be able to view it. Can our teachers look at it? Can the school administrators? Can the engineers of the software? Can marketers? Can the government? So if we were to think about what it means to build a safe digital place for learners, right? One that is both trusted and protected, a place that we can sort of store our data, our content, our permanent record, it has to mean a lot of things. The safety of our data has to be, has to recognize the importance of privacy, but also permanence, right? And we have to think really critically about trust and technology. I mean, students' data should be able to be preserved, but it needs to be preserved under students' control, right? Students actually should have the option to hit delete. Students should be able to say who gets to see or not see their work. And students have to be able to make better decisions about what that means in terms of the sharing of their personal data. They might choose to share, they might choose to save, they might choose to delete. It is their data, it is their learning, it should be their choice. As Corey noted, you know, students are punished as it currently stands for doing any of this. Students are told, students are compelled to trust. They can mutter, they can mutter about the tools they have to use, they can mutter about the practices of schooling, but they are forced to trust certain technologies and certain institutions. They aren't given a lot to help them be informed skeptics or informed resistors of either, right? And so once we add open, in quotes, <laughs> to this equation, it gets a lot tougher, right? Because what does it mean to trust an untrustworthy institution and an untrustworthy technology ecosystem in public? So I think we have to not just assume that more transparency and more sharing and perhaps even more open licenses does the work for us, right? Those are a lot of individual choices, but I think we have to address some of these longer histories of exploitation and extraction by institutions. So we have privacy, trust, open education, sort of the three questions we've been grappling with in this series. So I think that we should add to that context, equity, and justice. What if we can't trust school? What if we can't trust technology? Not now, not yet, right? So how do we build forward from that? And how do we build forward from that, not just as individuals, looking to be able to build our own networks. But how do we build from that as a collective? How do we as a collective think about what it looks like to have technologies and learning systems that are equitable, that are just, that we can trust, and that we can participate in openly and readily without us actually having to sacrifice our own data in order to be part of that world.